Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd first like to thank uh, Crystal Lee for squeezing me in uh, to this time frame here. I know, um, I guess I was sort of the last webinar to sneak in here, and I have uh, the shortest one, 15 minutes or thereabouts, so uh, um, I'll make it snappy. This is kind of, this talk is kind of like a short story about a unique weather phenomenon, and um, it's uh it's related to a high-impact weather event, which is kind of unique because it's snuggled up close and personal to uh, a benign weather feature we know as a surface ridge. So, of course, I'm referring to the land breeze snow squall. They're challenging for us, uh, these Lake Ontario land breeze snow squalls. Um, partly because of the, the high impact nature of the events around the western end of Lake Ontario. There's some six million people living here and it doesn't take much to, to create havoc. And uh, we don't get them that often so that's another problem too is uh, forecasting them in, in, in good order and, and letting people know that there's going to be this potential chaotic event uh, disrupting their lives. I'm going to be looking at, in some detail, at the January 25th case that we just had. It resulted in a 70-car multi-vehicle accident just on the eastern side of Toronto on one of our major expressways. And finally, some uh, tips for perhaps improving our forecast techniques for these, uh, these events. Okay, so we generally know how they form. Uh, these golden horseshoe land breeze squalls occur just tucked in on the west side of a retreating Arctic ridge. Impacts are huge because of localized very heavy snow. It can come in uh, very quickly and uh, you can almost get paralyzing conditions in a, very, in, in a fairly small area, but affecting a lot of people. And they're particularly challenging to forecast because they're synoptically benign. So you're not even thinking of high impact weather. You've got one foot up and on the desk and one eye is half open because uh, you've just got a big Arctic high that's over the region. You might be looking at an Alberta clipper coming in from the west for day two or day three, but that's about it. Uh, they're also infrequent here. Um, that's probably because you get a southeast wind, which is generally a warming wind. So it has to be super cold to get the convection to form in the first place. Uh, there's also a few clues. So the onus really is uh, for the human forecaster to anticipate them in advance. They're surprisingly shallow on soundings. Numerical models are in improving, but they still are not great. I'll, I'll show you an example here. Steering winds are light, therefore impact locations are challenging. They may only graze the shoreline areas, or they may sort of tease and taunt you from just offshore. Uh, with one eighth uh, statute miles in heavy snow, but really not much gets on shore. So, so they're complicated. They move slowly and evolve in shape and structure as well. And then, you know, it comes down to forecasting. Well, models don't get it very well, so <laughs> it comes a bit of a guessing game for forecast accumulation. So, just very quickly, we all know generally how they form. You have a synoptic to pattern with an Arctic high pressure ridge over the Eastern Great Lakes or New York State. Frigid temperatures over the land contrast with the warmer water temperatures to create a land breeze and resulting in low level convergence. And the convergence in lake moisture creates the land breeze snow band. Now if at night or in the early morning hours when it's even colder over the land, you get this uh, stronger temperature contrast which is amplified leading to stronger convergence and heavier squalls. No surprise there. The easterly flow in the wake of the ridge uh, will push the band on shore. That's a fairly short-lived event because those southeast winds become veered, they become sheared, there might be some weak warm air advection which is capping the, the squall, and then the fetch lessens as well. So it's really a sort of a time-limited kind of thing. This specific event happened just after 3 o'clock on January 25th, so you can see just to the east of Toronto here on the Highway 401, which is, um, I don't know if uh, many of you know, but it's, it's actually the busiest highway in all of North America. I think it even surpasses the Los Angeles expressways. Um, there were some 70 cars in a pileup here, and pretty, pretty ravage, ravaging looking uh, scenes here 
Uh, it's amazing that there was no fatalities, actually. Uh, so these, these are the westbound lanes of the 401 um, just after the event happened. Impacts, well, yes. Uh, we had a tractor trailer lost control around 3.30 or so. That re resulted in a 70 car pileup ensuing. The total six lanes of the Highway 400 were closed, both directions for some seven hours. Eight people were injured with uh, some quite serious injuries. We had special emergency procedures invoked at all area hospitals in Durham region, including calling in extra staff. A dozen ambulances responded across the region. And of course, air ambulances could not fly because of the weather conditions. I'm gonna show you here a roughly a 12 hour loop here of the radar. This should start kicking in anytime soon. I hope. Uh, there we go. So um, on the upper right-hand corner here is the timestamp. And uh, so this is early morning. And notice uh, this is one band that's kind of pointing towards Toronto, which is in here. Uh, I also want to highlight what looks to be a mesovortice that's uh, just offshore for much of the afternoon. Here's the, the squall as it comes ashore. Now this is going to be an arrow coming down here momentarily to mark the time and place of the accident that occurred just after 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Here's the squall coming uh, ashore. Now it's starting to uh, move over the lake as the wind's back uh, a little bit. So it's already done its damage there. It only persisted for three, four, uh, perhaps five hours, and uh, that's, that's all it took. Now I, was, I happen to be the lucky guy working this <laughs> these couple of days, so... Um, uh, this is the, the, the squall is kind of near and dear to my heart. I, I, it's, it was a bit of a challenge, but uh, the day before we issued a special weather statement highlighting the risk of a snow squall. Uh, this was in advance of an Alberta clipper, so just expecting a couple centimeters, but locally 5 to 10 is what, uh, what we highlighted. But I did say a snow squall warning is not anticipated. Well, I guess I ate those words the next day because I issued a snow squall warning midday. Uh, now, it was prior to making the, the squall making it uh, ashore. So I highlighted the regions, the timing, and um, some of the impacts down below there. So, uh, so and, and also 15 centimeters of snow. It turns out there was 15 to 20 centimeters in and around the Oshawa with the area with the squall. I wanted to highlight here uh, our raw uh, GEM regional guidance versus what we had in the forecast. So the raw guidance for the day before and the morning of predicted 60% chance of flurries. Um, the OSBC, uh, our Storm Prediction Center, predicted two to four centimeters of snow. Uh, pretty low, but we highlighted the region sort of right along the lake shore there, the Pickering Coburg areas. So, um, and this is sort of the pattern basically in a nutshell. These are thickness, 500 millibar, 1000 millibar thickness. So 516 thickness, notice the Alberta Clipper approaching, and so it's cold and retreating high off to the east, no surprise. And how did the model do? Well, this is the GEM Regional. This is a uh, the new upgrade, the 10 kilometer upgrade. Uh, this is from the six Zulu run. Um, and I want to point out that um, how innocuous these things are. You know, where do you think the high, highest impact weather around the Great Lakes is? Because we have south winds bringing in Snow bands off Lake Erie, Lake Huron, Georgian Bay. There's a quite a pronounced one off Lake Michigan. Doesn't affect us, but it's maybe interconnected with this Lake Superior band. So the highest impact was right here, about an hour after this uh, this time frame. Now the model did sort of catch up and sort of indicate uh, later in the day that there would be something interesting happening here. So it wasn't bad. This is the um, model formerly known as the LAM. <laughs> It's the high resolution deterministic uh, prediction system. These are hourly vertical velocities. So it wasn't too shabby actually. It had it sort of grazing the shoreline for a couple of hours late in the day before it sort of meandered south again over the lake. So not too, too bad, but uh, again, not great because it just didn't have it coming ashore exactly in the right spot. I'm overlaying the same land vertical velocity fields um, now these are hourly increments starting right now. So here's the radar. You can see the, the echoes showing up here. These yellow areas is the vertical velocity. So 
<clears throat> the radar echoes are certainly to the north. You can see this mesovortice to the southeast of Toronto as well showing up. So it's, it's offset. You can see that quite clearly. Uh, so it's got the right idea. I think a better way to access or to uh, forecast these things is to actually interrogate the model soundings. So I'm looking at three models of or three model soundings of interest here: Toronto Island, uh, Oshawa, and Cobra. Let's look at them individually briefly here. Toronto Island in the morning at 15 Zulu, you can see it's uh, convectively unstable in a fairly shallow layer with a south wind. By 18Z, it was uh, had a had a bit more oomph to it, maybe 4,000 feet of cloud depth, pretty unstable convective uh, uh, band coming through. So it's it's realizing seeing the band coming through. And what I wanted to point out here is that the steering flow is probably going to be bringing that into the city. Um, and there's 21 Zulu. Next one is the more eastern one. Uh, this is Coburg to the east of where the uh, the accident occurred. Notice the the winds uh, are becoming more um, veered. Um, early in the day they were northwesterly, they, then they came right around to the southeast. And by 21Z, it's it's pretty impressive. We have a, a decent squall here. But I wanted to point out the winds. Look at 24 Zulu. We have strong east winds up to 20 knots. So that's that's an interesting telltale sign of the structure of this thing. In Oshawa, this is uh, a site that got hit pretty hard. So they had one eighth statute mile in heavy snow at 21 Zulu. We have optimum snow growth. Um, everything's lining up, good winds. We have um, probably cloud depth of 6,000 feet. So a pretty impressive uh, feature here. Uh, and what I want to show here at 21 Zulu this gives a sense of the structure of the of the squall. You have you can imagine the convergence that's uh, that's uh, being depicted here by the model. It seems reasonable. You have more of a south wind at Toronto Island and a stronger east flow at Coburg. So you have a convergent area through here somewhere in the west end of the lake. Now another way, probably a better way to show this is um, using the synthetic aperture radar. This is from the radar sat one. This is a different day, but I wanted to show you what a typical squall looks like. Here's off uh, the north shore, the northern part of Lake Huron. This is probably a 30, 35 knot uh, west-northwest flow day. Um, this is more typical of squalls over the Great Lakes, but notice the structure is virtually the same. A, we often see this where it's stronger winds on the south core. In fact, you can see right in here, there's 33 knots on the south side adjacent to a 23 knots on the north side. So a very sharp gradient um, of wind field here. Now with our easterly squall, you can almost rotate this image and um, here's what we get. So this is 18 Zulu, one, accident, one hour before the accident. And you can actually see uh, the stronger winds on the north side. There's Coburg. So it was, it was in the model field depicted quite, quite well, I would think, with the 50 knot easterly wind. And I've superimposed kind of lightly here, faintly, the um, a semi-transparent image of the squall on radar. So it matches up pretty well. You can even see the mesovortice here showing up just southeast uh, part of the city. And even on the east side of the mesovortice, it's got slightly stronger winds than on the west side. So it's interesting to see the structure. The radar is probably, the beam is probably overshooting the, the snow band right in there, I would imagine it actually probably starts out in here and continues along this whole band out in here. So anyway, it's interesting. I just wanted to sort of use this as an uh, exclamation point that uh, the soundings are actually probably your best friend in, in analyzing these things and, and depicting how, how the evolution of these snow bands will, uh, will carry on. So, and just the last slide here uh, is uh, some forecasting tips. So yeah. Super cold air, uh, 516 dam thickness or less. Uh, awareness of the synoptic pattern is important, even though it's benign. <laughs> they may, may occur at any time of the day, but generally more intense in the morning. And sufficient instability is a requirement, of course, as well. And model fields are, offer clues, mainly moisture, low-level vertical velocity, et cetera. But I think the, the better approach is um, 
is to interrogate your forecast soundings using temperature curve for timing, instability, cloud depth, and your snow growth profiles, and also the wind field for timing and the shape, and uh, the shear can determine your intensity as well, and the duration of the event, as well as inland penetration. And yeah, snowfall amounts, well, I think we're getting slowly better with this, uh, although we, we often under forecast them still. For a 2,500 foot uh, cloud depth for these events, five to 10 centimeters in a two to three hour period is not surprising. For 5,000 feet or more, which is the case on with this January 25th event, you can expect 15 centimeters plus, so warning criteria. Finally, just some future work, it would be interesting to look at some past cases and maybe to look at some composite studies. Um, I've often thought a land breeze squall index of so, some sort might be unique uh, and, and, and uh, maybe worthwhile on the desk tied in with some pop-up alerting system. You have the most benign weather associated with these things. 99% of the time, a retreating high will not give you anything. But uh, in these cases, it can. And um, I mean, you can issue a short notice snow squall if you see it forming offshore, but it's better to have a bit more notice, I think. And I will field any questions. Thank you very much. So how much snow we've got in Nigeria? Yeah, it was probably close to 15 to 20 centimeters. Yeah. That was in the Whitby area? Yeah. North of Wade Zalaji. <laughs> <laughs> so, Aaron, this is uh, Mark Alexar. Um, that mesovortex that they had over, I guess, the Toronto Island, it was clearly that's what steered the, uh, the, the snow breeze up into the Coburg, Oshawa area. I think so. And what was it? Do you know what spun it up or what caused it? Or I don't know for sure. I, I, it, it might have something to do with uh, enhanced convergence, uh, with frictional effects with the land to the north side of that. It's not the okay. first time I've seen them. Um, but they, you know, they can occur mid-lake very easily too. So, yeah. uh, so maybe the Scarborough Bluffs might have something. Well, it's possible. Yeah, it's um, it was there for a number of hours too. But it, I think it did help to propel that squall north um, as well into Scarborough in the east part of Toronto as well. So not just Newcastle to uh, Wade Zalachi's place. So, yeah. <laughs> hey, Arn. This is Bob down in Buffalo. How you doing? Well, good, Bob. How are you? Very good. Hey, excellent presentation as usual. Thank you. Hey, uh, was this event kind of looked like a, a combination of an easterly flow and a, a tea kettle uh, kind of event? Yeah, tea kettle comes to mind. Um, um, no, just, just a comment on that and that, uh, the vortices. We see a lot of those uh, mesoscale vortices with those bands over the lake. Seems like they're a lot more common um, now that we can look for them. You can see them on radar a lot easier than you can see them in satellite, but we see a lot of those. Yeah, and, and final question, what were your surface temperatures with that snow? You know offhand? Um, I'm going to say minus 10 to minus 12, uh, so that would be about, uh, uh, yeah, 10, well, 10 to 12 Fahrenheit, I think, something like that. Okay, but, but Arctic air, because I, I was going to say with that Arctic high, your temperatures probably would have been uh, lower than what you'd normally see during a lake effect event, and you get that real greasy snow. Uh, we see that here when you get, you know, your your snowfall between 25 and 30 Fahrenheit versus low 20s or colder. You get that you, you, instead of getting dendrites, you get the platelets, and and it's real greasy and it tends to be harder to drive in than your typical wet snow. So I don't know if that contributed to the to the problems or not. Yeah, I think it was actually pretty fluffy, uh, pretty fluffy snow. Actually, it was. Um it, it came down pretty hard, fairly fairly decent flakes, lots of them. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was not the greasy type snow that we usually get here. So. Uh, uh, and then a final comment: uh, your radar, you guys go down to what, 0.1 in the winter on your lowest slice? Do you know? That would have been that, that would have been 0.1, I believe. Okay, because I know a lot of those tea kettle things we have trouble seeing once we get you know 40 or 50 miles out. And uh, with your lower slice from King, you probably had a much better look at it than we would. Yeah, you could see it quite far out there into the sort of mid-lake, but uh, I suspect it was even further as the beam overshot it. But, uh, yeah, it was an interesting scenario. Okay, good talk, though. Thanks, Bob. Anybody else? 
Okay, thank you, Arne.